Actually, what I want to talk about today are different kinds of non-localities for quantum systems. And I will start with the most important non-locality, which I think is discussed in a wrong way by every quantum physicist. The non-locality I have in mind is the non-locality that is represented by the fact that you say that a quantum particle can be a wave. You say the quantum particle can be a non-local entity which is spread all over space. Everybody believes that that is what is new about quantum mechanics, and that is completely a wrong belief. Suppose you say to many in the street, a quantum particle can be at the same time at two different locations. And the many in the street will ask you the following. The electron has a charge and has a mass. Given charge and given mass. What happens in these two points? Is part of the charge the mass here and part of the charge and the mass is here? If this would be the case, then when I do a measurement and find the part in here, that charge that was here must have jumped very quickly here. There will be a big magnetic force and it could not happen. It doesn't happen in real experiment. So I ask you people that claim that the party can be at the same time in two different locations, what do you mean by it? You might, you might say, okay, we mean by it, there is some kind that is called a, a amplitude, and the amplitude is here and here, and that amplitude will show itself later in experiment. But what is this amplitude? How is it connected with the physical property of the electron directly? Can somebody here answer that question? Let's can you answer that question? You will say the many words, I will say the part here. One word. But one word, word. I'm a wave and I'm here as a shape. Sorry? My wave. I am just a wave. The shape. This what does it mean as far but what about the charge and the mass? Is it spread in space? It's a property in Hamiltonian that does not have no, no, that's not an answer. answer. That's not an answer that any physicist may accept. That is something spread in space or not. When we have a classical way, there is a pro local property at every point in space, like electric field, density of energy and momentum. There is something there at every point of space. So I am saying that really, the reason why people until today really don't fully understand quantum mechanics is because scientists took the wrong direction when quantum mechanics started. When quantum mechanics started, it started in two different ways. First, there was Heisenberg. And Heisenberg started with describing his geometrics and trying to understand how this mathematics evolved in time. That was a very, very complicated thing to do mathematically. It could show, to, together with Paul and other people, simple examples like harmonic oscillator, hydrogen atom, but the minute they came to a more complicated system, it was very, very difficult to solve. Few months later, Schrodinger follow, following what the boy suggested, he said, ah, if it's quantum relation can be away, I will try you, I will write the wave equation. And he wrote the Schrodinger wave equation, and lo and behold, it was very easy to solve with this equation, practically every problem. So everybody left Heisenberg, everybody joined the Schrodinger version, and Heisenberg was the only, that can't be quantum mechanics, that's not what it's all about, but nobody listens to it. And then, from then on, people learn to develop intuition about wave functions. And let me say that what we have, we have a wave function. And that intuition wasn't really a physical intuition. So what I want to show in this talk, first of all, is to show that the basic new thing about quantum mechanics is not the kinematics, which tell you that the system is discovered at a given time by a wave function, but rather the dynamical difference between classical and quantum mechanics. 
In Sassy of Physics, we describe the dynamics by Hamilton expansion of motion, which are completely local. In the quantum mechanics, we describe the dynamics by Heisenberg expansion of motion. When you look at the Heisenberg expansion of motion for simple systems, they look very similar to a classical physics. But if you look at the Heisenberg expression of motion for an interesting situation where you have interference, then it turns out that the variable, Heisenberg variable that describes these things, have no local equation of motion. So there are two ways to think what happens in interference. One way, if we look at basic new thing about quantum designing, We say that if we have two sleeves and we send one electron after another, and there is a photographic page here, we see that if only one of the two sleeves is open, some of the electrons will appear at this point. If the two sleeves are open, no electron appears here. The question is how to understand it. So one way to understand it is to say the previous electron is away. Part of the waves come here, part of the waves come here, and the two paths destructively interfere. This is the simple explanation, and it's wrong, because that explanation says that the same electron must at the same time go through here and through here, but there is no massive charge that goes at the same time through here and here. There is another possible answer to that, and the answer is. That even though the electron goes only through one sleep, it knows that the other sleep is open or not because it has another property that has a non local equation of motion. And that property depends, it behavior depends on whether that sleep is open or closed. Now, when we say something like this, we miss it on into a difficulty because we say, look, if there is a property here that depends whether this is open or closed, it seems to be violating causality. Because I can decide just when the electron passing through here, just before they close this hole, and something will change here. So the only way that this could work consistently is that, that property that is affected locally must be completely uncertain. If it's completely uncertain, then the change in it will be unobservable. So we first of all discover that if we believe that in quantum mechanics there are no local equations of motion, that must mean that there must be uncertainty. And not only quantitative uncertainty, but a qualitative uncertainty that says that the thing that is relevant is completely uncertain under this condition. But then you say, look, if it's completely uncertain, what does it mean to say that it's changed? That's why we are saying by looking at the way we look at quantum mechanics with two bounded conditions in time. So let, let us see, let me show you first how to think now about the interference in the right way. Because I look at the interference in one dimension, I have just the one dimension, and I have a superposition of two wave packets that move towards each other. Then, when the two wave packets meet here, after some time, a series of field patterns that depends on the relative momentum. Because the wave function here is to the minus x minus l square times e to the i k zero of f plus e to the minus f plus l square times e to the minus i k zero of f divided by delta square. And then in, in time, the two <coughs> Gaussian meet, and we get cosine k zero of f, which is given to this of here. So we start with an ensemble of particles, ensemble of electrons, each one of them goes after the other, and 
we observe this interference pattern by risk measurement. This is very important that people always say that quantum systems have no properties because every measurement must disturb it. But there is a limit where they <laughs> want to infinite that we can have measurement of the ensemble that cause no disturbance at all as a limit when it goes to infinite. So if we do this experiment with larger, larger, larger particles, we can look and find this interference pattern without disturbing each individual particle. Because we did not disturb each individual particle, we can wait after the two wave packets go through and then check on each electron which particle, whether it went this way or that way. And lo and behold, now we know for all the particles through which suite they went, maybe through which they went, and nevertheless, there was a pattern. So the statement is usually people say, once you find through which suite the particle goes, there could have been an interference. That's absolutely wrong. We know now that each particle went through one suite, and nevertheless, it shows interference pattern. So there must be a different way to describe the interference rather than to decide by saying that it must have gone through both suites. And here's how Heisenberg described it. He did not do it, but that's how he should have described it. Suppose <laughs> <clears throat> you look at this a superposition of two wave packets that are separated by distance A. In the cellular picture, we describe it by a superposition of two waves like this. In the Heidelberg picture, we have to find an observable, which is a function of X and P. And this observable has the property that this superposition is either set of this observable. And then we can look how this observable changes the function of time. We hold it to Heisman equation of motion. And then in revolution, we tell us everything what happened to the system, even though we describe it by a single observable that we can observe without disturbing the system in principle. Because it, the system is always an entropy when we consider its time evolution. So the interesting question is, what is this observable that corresponds to a superposition of two wave packets? That is the insight. So suppose I write a state chi, vector chi, which is chi left, plus chi right, multiplied by e to the i c. So what will happen eventually if it interferes depends also on this phase three, because let me detect well, it will be cosine of k zero x minus k zero times x minus three in the interference. So we have to find an operator, which is a function of x and p, which this is an eigenvalue. And it turns out that any operator If I can write as a superposition of A and M times F to the N, P to the M, any such operator cannot be sensitive to this phase C. Because if I look at the average of this operator, even though the momentum is the end derivative, the end derivative of this does not, the end derivative of this does not zero over zero over zero over it with this one. Therefore, any such operator will not be sensitive to the relative phase field. Because, for example, I calculate the integral of psi star left of x plus psi star right of x times e to the minus i p. And the end derivative. times psi n of x plus e to the i pi 
Chai Eto Tzif, that is the high type Chai Ai. You can see immediately that the only thing that depends on the relative phase are the mixed terms, because the same term to three chances. The mixed terms give us zero, zero effects in the integral because they have no relative term. Therefore, the observable that is relevant of the sort of position is a new kind of observable, which is e to the i dx times l. That operator times psi left is equal to psi left times f plus l, and then psi right is psi right times f plus l, and that thing, this operator certainly is ever right will depend on the relative phase. So the modular variable, sinus and cosine of PSL, they are observables that are sensitive to the issue, what is the interference? And the time that the time the real zero, these observables are non local. That is the important thing. If I look at each of the I, PSL, let's let look at this time derivative. That is equal to the commutator of E to the I PSL with the Hamiltonian. That thing with the Hamiltonian is PS squared plus potential D of X. Then I have to calculate the commutator of E to the I PSL over H times D of X. And this is equal to V of S plus L minus V of S times E to the I PL over H bar. And you see, therefore, that this is a truly non local in a equation of motion because in the positive position S, it also knows whether there is a potential as a position X plus L or not. So that is the way that we can understand the first type of non-locality, which is the non-locality that is trying to tell us that the party must be spread. It's not true. The party is always a point. But we may not know where this point is, but we must say that all the mass of the child is always concentrated at one location. And the only reason why we have the text like its appearance are not due to wave properties, they are due to non locality of the new dynamics of quantum behavior. Now, let me tell you a story that some of you might have heard, a truly historical story. In 1964 or 5, I visited Munich and Heidelberg was still alive for a few more years. And uh, I went to, be, to visit the Max Planck Institute, and uh, I met the assistant of, of uh, Heidelberg, uh, Hans Duhr, and asked me what I'm doing. I told him that I am interested in this local issue. He said, oh, I'm sure Heidelberg would like to hear about it. So I came to Heidelberg's office, and we started to talk, and then I asked him, Professor Heidelberg, how do you explain interference in your picture. He said, oh, I don't know. I saw that you must use weight, weight properties for that. And I showed him this new idea. He was so excited about it that from then on, uh, Do met many years later Jeff and told him that from that, on, that, that, that day on, any visitor that will come to Heidelberg, the first thing he will take him to the blackboard and show him how one can explain the interference picture in his language. Okay, so this is one example of a novel priority that you have to learn how to talk about. Now I'm <coughs> I will show you another example.
Suppose I have two cavities and the wall here allows a little bit of the way passing from here to the to leaking to here. So we have a potential here, which is alpha times a delta of x. And suppose I have here a wave pattern that goes back and forth. So each time there is an epsilon locking which leaks out. Now, if there is a perfect mirror here, we know that each time the link, the thing that leaks will add up constructively. So eventually the whole thing will go from here to here, and then we will we, we'll go back. On the other hand, if this mirror is not here, at the same time, each wave packet runs out, and therefore from the same end passes, instead of the thing adding up to one, it will be n times one over n squared, and it will be the thing will be left here with, with, with probability one minus one over n, if n is one over epsilon. Now suppose I have the following thing. Suppose this particle has a spin half. And I rent the mirror here to depend on the spin. If the spin is sigma z equal to plus one, there is a mirror here. And if the spin is equal to minus one, there is no mirror here. The mirror only refers sigma z equal to plus one. Sigma z equal to minus one will go through. Wouldn't you like so, to do it? Hmm? Yeah, here, wouldn't you like to do it with polarization? Uh, Sorry? Uh, you can do it also with polarization. I can do it, but let me do it with speed. I can do it, you can do the same thing with the phone. So, so I'm saying the phone. If I start with sigma z equal to plus one, and there's the perfect mirror, after I time one over epsilon, the panther particle will be completely here, and after the time, Two over epsilon, the path will come back here, but very positively with a sine minus one. You can prove it, okay? Only after four epsilon, the path will come back with the same sign. But after two epsilon, two over epsilon, the path will come back here with minus one. So if on the other hand, I start with sigma equal, if sigma is equal to minus one, the path will stay here with the probability as close to one as I like. So suppose I start now with the particle having sigma e equal to plus one. So it's a super position of sigma z equal to plus one, but sigma z equal to minus one. What will happen after two equal, t, t equal to one over epsilon? The sigma z, sigma x equal to plus one is the sum of sigma z equal to plus one, but sigma z equal to minus one. After this time, the sigma z equal to minus one can pass here with a minus sign. That means that after the time t equal to one over epsilon, the, I will find here the particle with the opposite spin, right? You agree? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, it's, now you will see a non locality which is a, a stronger non locality than the interaction field measurement because the following will happen. I start the pattern again with sigma z equal to plus one. I know that all the time that particle stays here. The probability it was not here goes to zero. After the time t equals to one over epsilon, I do a post selection and I find that sigma e at the time t equals to one over epsilon was equal to plus one. So I started so. In this time, initially I started with sigma z equal to plus one. 
and the time t equal to one over epsilon, t2. I found the part in here with sigma is equal to plus one. Now, I use my two vector formulation and say, I can go back in time and ask what does this future boundary condition tell me what was the beginning here? Ultimately, <coughs> the beginning here was sigma is equal to minus one. Because if I were to start with sigma is equal to plus one, it will end up with sigma is equal to minus one. So see what I know now. I know that the boundary was all the time here, and nevertheless, experience this direction change from plus one to minus one. What happened? After all, there is absolutely no magnetic field here. Nothing can affect the spin in this direction. But the passing the must come here in order for its spin to change, but the passing was never there. It was always here, and nevertheless, its spin in this direction changed. What's, the, what's going on here? Do, do you understand the paradox? This is, it's unbelievable variation of the interaction free measurement. Here, the fact that I put a mirror of magnetic field here affects non locally the spin of the particle here, with the particle never being there. Okay? Much, much stronger effect than the usual interaction free measurement. You know what the answer to this is? It's the thing that I discovered that I named. It a uh, special case effect. It turns out that although the particle was standing all the time here, lo and behold, it spin left it in the interaction. There was a current here only of spin, not of particle, not of sharp, not of mass. There is only a spin flowing here, and that spin was absorbed by this. So here is an example, a much stronger case of non-local phenomena, where you can affect the property of a particle as far away, because that property can leave the particle, go by itself, and feel then the effect that, that, that affects it. So how can we describe intuitively what's going on? I mean, this is like a miracle. And I don't like miracles. I would like to be able to tell stories about what's going on, the trouble all the world will understand. So here's the story. When we do pre and post selection, we can have situations, in fact, always, where some projection operators turn out to be negative. The weak value of some projection operator turn out to be negative. In fact, this, this must be the, always the case. Because, for example, Suppose I, I find the sigma z weak is equal to three. Is it possible? But so I can have a pin post selection. In fact, in our original article, we asked how is it possible that the spin half can have the value 100. So let's take a special case of the weak value of sigma z is equal to three. How to understand it? I know that I can write the operator of sigma z is the projection operator on sigma z equal to plus one minus the projection operator of sigma z equal to minus one, right? This is the now so the weak value of sigma z, this the weak value is an additive property, it will be the weak value of the positive projection operator minus the weak value of negative projection operator. On the other hand, I know. Then the weak value of the positive one plus the weak value of the negative one must be equal to one because there is this is an identity. So from the two of them, I see that the correct answer here is the projection operator of spin equal to plus one is plus two, and the projection operator of spin minus one must be minus one to give altogether the value of three. So the question is how to give it a, how to interpret what is the meaning of a negative projection operator. Let's take our simple example of the three boxes. 
I start with the supposition of the particle being in one of the squares of three times box number one plus box number two plus box number three. And suppose this concept of the motion. And in the final time, I choose the state uh, one plus two minus three. So the product of the two states is plus one, therefore the denominator is one, and the weak value to find the particle here is one, the weak value to find the particle here is one, the weak value of the protection operator here is minus one. And the question is what interpretation should we give it? Now, if you are mathematically inclined that you don't want to see intuitively, you say, ah, it's a relative probability. In fact, the assignment used the uh, idea of negative probability. If you do calculation with negative probability, you get the high, high chances. But again, this is not a good physical intuition. A good physical intuition is to say, how do I, how do I make a weak measurement to find what is here? I'm not allowed to open the box because then it will be a strong measurement. So to see what is here, by weak measurement, I will, for example, measure the electric field outside, the gravitational field outside, and I will find that if I do, if this is an electron, the electric field here, the magnetic field here, will be sufficiently weak that if I measure them, I will do a weak measurement. Why? Because the electric field of the electron is small compared to the mass fluctuation, and therefore the shift for a single electron is a weak measurement. So by weak measurement here, I will find that to all respect, the thing that is inside the box is like a particle that has the same mass of the electron in magnitude, but it's minus the mass because the gravitational field here, the weak value of it will be negative. Instead of it being a person, it will be a particle. Similarly, the charge here will be the opposite charge in the electron. So I say, there will be a physical intuition that in all weak measurement, I can think about the negative projection operator as being a particle, a true particle, but with the opposite properties than the normal particle. You can call it a, a counter spin, a counter twin. It's a twin that has the opposite properties than the other one. So now, I can explain this thing that looks as if does the spin was moving here. In fact, I'm saying that what happens if I do a Cheshire case effect, let me describe it carefully. I start with a particle that has a third position of wave packets. This wave packet stands still, and this wave packet moves with some velocity of V. Okay, two graphs here. And I know so the it's a supposition of this third death with sigma x in both of them, this is spin up particle being equal to plus one. This is my initial state. Ninety-one. At ninety-two, I have this thing this same field for sigma x equal to plus one. This one is moved up to here. So I consider it here, but with sigma is equal to minus one. So now I compare the pre and post selection. I see that at this time, the pre selection is here with uh, sigma is equal to plus one, and the post selection is the same location with sigma is equal to minus one. So I can say that I have a positive projection operator being here of a particle electron having spin plus one and the negative projection operator here with a spin equal to minus one. But the next, so I will describe it then by saying that what happens in this case is that I have two particles moving with the same shape 
On top of each other, one of them is a positive mass particle, the other of them is a negative mass particle. They are moving together, so the total charge here is zero, total mass here is zero, but they carry magnetic moment because the, the spin, the, the opposite particle having negative spin has a positive magnetic moment. So what I see here is that's the spin magnetic moment moving with the even velocity and the same shape it was before. And this is now a physical picture that I can understand. I can begin to ask questions. If this is the shape, how do I separate the two of them? Can I separate them for white and bring them back so that they come back to the final uh, posture? So what happens if I try to put on this pair of positive and negative? Mass pair, I put an electric field here. If I put an electric field here, to the positive particle, the normal particle, it gets momentum in one direction. The other particle gets momentum in the opposite direction because it has the opposite charge. But it has also the opposite moment, inertial mass, so that both of them are accelerated in the same direction and they don't get separated. But if on the other hand I put a gradient of magnetic force, magnetic field, that gives the same momentum to both of them because it is momentum proportional to magnetic moment, and both of them have the same magnetic moment. So now the whole that will separate them, and they will start to move in the opposite direction. Then I bring them back together so they can, can end up with the final. Uh, the final state so that I will have the same postulation. So I'm saying that we can develop a new intuition about quantum mechanics if we say the following things. First of all, all the people, all the people told us that the quantum, quantum system don't have properties because any time you try to look at them, you disturb them, and therefore you never see what was really there. So I say that is wrong. You should learn how to observe quantum system by weak measurement. You do the measurement sufficiently weakly, you don't disturb what is there. So there is a new kind of reality that is really there, that I call weak reality, and that reality is really very rich. It rich because I discover now that instead of having just a single particle, I have many particles, many pairs of counter particles, and I can see all of that if I do with measurement. So all the longer, non longer phenomena that we see are due to these possibilities of having this new kind of reality. In fact, I think Kai is going to tell you that there is another example that is a multiplication of the interaction with measurement where you could understand what's going on only if you look in this language of pair of counterparticles. There are many, many more examples, but I'm afraid I'm not sure how much time I have. I have still some time? Oh. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's about time, yes. Yeah, so okay, so I read to ask questions. But I'm saying, if you have to learn to tell stories about quantum mechanics, that you can tell it logically and with simple mathematics, so you don't have to talk about complicated notions like Amplitudes that nobody will understand unless he does a lot of mathematics. There is very simple language you can learn if you learn to talk in my language. Thank you very much. Question. Yes. Uh, you describe the spin being absorbed by. Like, yeah. You describe the spin being absorbed by something, right? Yeah. The particle. What is the what is the body that absorbs it? Is it a macroscopic object? Uh, yeah, the, the, the mirror that was there, the mirror that was there, like a magnetic mirror that absorbed. Just the, a question. The, so in that, fact, you can if you do it with many many can you see you will see eventually that this mirror did absorb the an angular momentum altogether. Ah, so you can see the angular momentum. Of yeah, the it mirror. can there is a little bit of something there. Yeah. Um, any other question? Yes. Uh, yeah, you know, this is a bit of a philosophical uh, question. Yes. Uh, 
but I figured you are the person to uh, answer it. Yeah. Um, yeah. One key word in what you say was understand. Okay. Now, okay. the world understand. So, to me, the world understand. Say it again. The world understand. Yeah. Yes. So, the world, for me, the world understand. Yeah. Means that uh, uh, I have some uh, intuition or early experience, and now comes something uh, uh, new, and I'm able to match this something new with my earlier intuition, uh, experience, whatever. No, that's the wrong attitude. The right attitude is that you can develop a new intuition, right? You are telling a story that is logical and simple to understand. Let me give you an example. When Einstein discovered special relativity, it really opened possibilities to Amelie, where somebody can go fast and not age at all, etc. But once he did some simple thought experiment, accepting that one condition, the velocity of light is the same for all observers, people that study can develop a new intuition what special relativity means. It's very different from our everyday intuition, but because you go through this short experiment again and again, and you see how logical they are, once you accept one axiom, then you can develop your intuition. Okay, I, 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 I understand that. Uh, okay. I accept it. But th so the question is this, uh, uh, what, what you're doing, what you're telling us is uh, an attempt to develop this new intuition, new experience, or is it uh, something that uh, uh, you do in the hope of uh, finding some niche, some angle that will give rise to a new experiment, which is unexpected to some both, extent? Both. I mean, when you have a theory, if you know what stories say about the theory, it's not only that you understand it better, but it also opens the way to ask new questions. So for example, this is, this is a, a real example. When I develop my two vector formulations, start to say we think my is equal to one here and see my y equal to one here. Then at that time people say from here to here. Because all these things are equal to one, and from here to here, it will seem more equal to one. Then my new picture that I developed is by my language will say, say, no, actually, both of them are near, right? In the middle time, I know both sigma is equal to one and sigma y equal to one. Once I have this picture, you can suddenly ask a new question How do I observe? That both of them are there. This is a question that you will never ask if you would have the old picture. So when I ask the question, how do I deal with all of them are there? And I realize that it would be the sigma h per sigma y is equal to two if both of them are there. And then having the possibility, then I realize that you can observe this only if you do weak measurement, because any strong measurement will necessarily disturb one of them. So a weak measurement will give you really the new value too, and that's how the whole picture of weak values and amplification, huge number of, of, of effects came out of this thing. Also, quantum works and, and, and supersymmetries, all of this came from looking <coughs> in this new way. So a good story is first of all something that let you intuitively understand what happened in other cases, and also help you to ask new interesting questions. Thank you. You used strong words, wrong interpretation. Yeah. Now, it, the question, uh, would no, you it, say that it's also inconsistent? Because you say that you have this example and uh, you have this miracle, how you can explain uh, that uh, the particle never been there, but somehow it bleeds the uh, yeah, 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 Let me explain to you what I mean by wrong, okay? Let me, please, I will answer you. Suppose I have two boxes, and I start initially with superposition 
one half here, one half there, or one of the two. And at the later time, I find the part in here. This is T1, this is T2. Now, since I believe that because the particle could never exist from here to here, if I find it it's here, it must have been also here the we wait, 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 wait. This what, is what? just contradict what you said just one minute before. One minute before you say that this is not enough. You have one going forward, sigma e. And and I did not I did not think. I did not think. So one way that I would like to talk about to say, look, I know both information from the past, I know it's this part there, from the future, I know it's there. That is the whole record. Because if I tell you why, if you take any man in the street, look, I know for sure that the part is in both places, and I know for sure that the part is one place. This is the whole language. You can have a mathematics play game. But that can be at the same time in two locations for sure, and at the same time in one location. It, it's not a good language. That's all. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a relational meaning. If somebody will measure one, he will find it with certainty. Somebody will measure another, he also will find it with certainty. No, but so this must be true. No, the point is the way. way paradoxical, like all these paradoxes, we have this paradox. No, 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 yeah, but I, I will tell you the correct language. The correct language is uh, in the Heidelberg language. The particle in the Heidelberg language from this thing, you have three operators sigma z, sigma x, and sigma y. Any set of sigma z tells you where the particle is. So the A values of the vector one zero. Is sigma z equals to plus one, zero one, and sigma z equals to one one. Then you have another operator of sigma x, which tells you that sigma x is equal to plus one, it is plus then, and sigma x equals to minus one, and this one and that. So in the Heidelberg language, I say, I know for sure that the pattern is here, and I know also for sure the pattern has the property sigma x equals to plus one, that I can see that it's there if I wait enough time. And I will see that if I start with sigma y, you see, if you look at it in the height of this, you say the following. This is the xy, and this is orthogonal. So xz, xzy, and, and sigma is the orthogonal. So the return in the height of the picture is epsilon times sigma x. Epsilon times sigma x tells you that the spin in this plane is rotating, and after a while of an epsilon, it, it, it comes here, etc. And you see that I can have, knowing both of them, this and that, I know that if I wait enough time, that sigma y will change the local property sigma z. So I'm saying, that the correct picture, I think the correct physical picture, is to say I have a particle that has both properties, A being zero, which is sigma z equal to plus one, and B having a property sigma y, which is sitting on the particle, and the way that I see what sigma y is, I wait enough time, where sigma y, like the velocity, takes to a position. So, in fact, what I have here, in the hand of this it's a very nice thing. I have an operator of sigma x, which tells me what is the energy. I have an operator of sigma z, which tells me where the particle is. I have an operator of sigma y, which is like a velocity. I can't see it immediately because I can see only local things. I wait enough time that sigma y will convert into sigma z. Now that sigma y has no local equations of motion. So if I open here a potential where the particle is here, but it has also sigma y definitely, that potential will turn sigma y to minus one, and then if I wait the same amount of time, instead of finding it here, I will find it there. So the number of my equation of motion, plus the physical picture is something that I can understand as a physicist. 
to say that I had a property that at the same time started both here and at the same time here and here. This is the language that I call wrong. You can use this language mathematically, but it doesn't make sense physically. That's what I'm asking. That's my point. I think we should close the discussion here. Uh, Andrew had to go and teach, so I'm good to chair the rest of this session. Thank you, Yakir. Thank you.